Welcome, everybody, to another a wonderful episode, a great, amazing episode of Podcast of Players. And you'll never believe who I have on this week. Ugh, I say this week. Who could as, it possibly be? Yeah, yeah. I say this week like I do a weekly episode when it's like months in between episodes. No, <laughs> uh, I have someone who I've been wanting to have on for a very long time. Uh, the creator and player behind your beloved character, Absurd, uh, who has made many D&D uh, animations and like Curse of Strahd replays and all sorts of cool stuff rules sort of videos about like uh fourth edition <laughs> dnd and such and uh i hey you know him you love him everybody give it up for puffin forest hey hello welcome thank you for having me really appreciate it thank you uh i come in from the side and then i there's like the big armchair and i go and i sit down on it so. yeah <laughs> exactly yeah, between two ferns with <laughs> zach alfanakis style mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so i'm so glad to have you on the show i really it's been a while since yeah. uh, a lot of things since like we first started talking since we last played D&D &D together or magic for that matter. Yeah. Um, and also yeah. since I was going to have you on like way earlier, but I never I don't know. That's on me. I, I had this idea in my head. <laughs> I was going to have you on after the fourth episode of the Peace Guild, but that just isn't going to come out anytime soon. So yeah. I was like, well, might as well just have him on. <laughs> like, I don't need to like yeah, draw then... this out. Yeah, and then we, it was also, we played the Star Wars campaign for a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. people, so, so, I, there's a lot of interview questions I could just, like, begin asking you. Um, okay, but sure. I think a lot of people know some of the things, like, hey, you're a YouTuber, and you've got a big channel, and, uh, you've got some very lovable characters that you've, uh, highlighted in, in some of your videos. Um, oh, thanks. what some of you might not know from, like, the newer videos, uh, You've been, you've done not too long ago some recap like sort of uh, stories about our Star Wars game, which I'm yeah. so thrilled with. I love them. No, oh, thanks. <laughs> I was like, I was, um, I was so surprised when the first one came out. Like my eyes bugged out of my skull. Like, like <laughs> oh my god, I was in that. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, I was very like surreal to to see my character in a, in one of your videos and uh yeah 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 it was it was great to see it was great to be able to make those uh videos and particularly it's i was gonna say it's a unique system but it's a unique setting with like star wars fifth edition yeah yeah it's also like we played so even though the first video came out about a year ago it says on on your channel like we played earlier than that like another year prior to that or something like that or maybe like yeah um, several months and the game has changed it's like an evolving system like the rules now are not exactly the same as they were before like they changed all the like classes and stuff up i actually did not know that because i haven't actually checked star wars fifth edition in a while but yeah i do know that because it was like a fan-made project every single it was like they were constantly updating it and trying out new things yeah i, I heard the creator has been very obstinate about their changes like when people try to give them feedback like we don't like this it breaks this class they're like too bad download the old version by the way that's going to go offline in two days so you have two days to get that old version and then you can't get it anymore and so like oh, I, I so i did that i ended up downloading like one of the older versions of the game so i could have one that i just i understand <laughs> it has the old version yeah, of the rules you actually were more experienced with the system than I was because you had played it uh, in one other campaign before, That's and then this right. was your second time running it. Whereas this was my first time running um, Star Wars, and um, I had always wanted to run in Star run Star Wars. I know I had played the um, the Fantasy Flight version, which is. Um, the one with the dice. Everyone just calls right. it the dice one. <laughs> uh, Edge of the Empire. I know they released like more expansions of that that system, but I always remember just the first book, and that's what I always called it was Edge of the Empire. Yeah, yeah. I think that's probably that's to me like I remember Edge of the Empire coming out, and it was it came it was like a big book, and it was very memorable. And then like I think they had released each of them like a year later, or maybe like two like a year and a half after each one. Mm -hmm. Um, and so and each subsequent book that came out, I think it, it, my my perception of this, and this could be wrong, is that each one was like less and less popular. Like fewer and fewer people ran it. Yeah. Most people ran the original Edge of the Empire, and then like fewer and fewer people ran the subsequent ones, like Age of Rebellion and um, Force and Destiny. 
Yeah, because the biggest issues that people had with the first two books, because I think even in the second book, they didn't really do it. Uh, they didn't have like force users. You could be force sensitive and you could have like really min minor like force powers, but you couldn't be a Jedi. You couldn't be a Sith until the third book, I think, came out, uh, which was yeah. many years after the first book. And people are like, we've been wanting God, to yeah. play Jedi this whole time and you didn't let us. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's the the way that they did it. I understand their reasoning was because they correlated each of the books to a, a, a movie. So Edge of the Empire is based on A New Hope. And in there, you only got one person who's a jet. You got the sit, you know, you got Darth Vader and then you have Obi-Wan and Obi-Wan's like not really a Jedi I, or like, OK, he is a Jedi, but it's like he only uses like his very light force powers. And so they're like, OK, that's the only stuff that you can do. You can only do that kind of stuff and then the next one's like the military movie and then the last one is actually where you have the big jedi like flipping around deflecting lightning lasers and hands stuff. all yeah. that stuff yeah yeah and that one also i think is based off of the prequels a little bit so but yeah you're correct that in terms of like it, you know edge of the empire comes out and everyone wants to play like these jedi like the knights and stuff and then you got to wait like three four years down the line for the supplemental book to come out right you know, Star Wars is simultaneously so interesting and so frustrating of a of a property mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. <laughs> I really, I really love uh, the idea of it, the world building that they they go through, especially like the more nerdy, like a lot of the extended stuff. The uh, uh, what was it? The, the, the non canon stuff now. The uh, the books, the novels that had come out after the first trilogy um yeah extended universe that's it yeah uh that stuff is really cool and then they were like yeah none of that's real here's some subpar movies that will actually be canon and i'm like really solo you're gonna go with this oh, okay. <laughs> yeah i never i never followed up with a lot of the because i i do know that there was the pre-book like books that were canon for a while and then got decanonized mm -hmm. um but I don't I, I never actually met anyone who had read them. Uh, so you said that you had seen all that stuff or like so, a fan of that. Or? Well, all right. So let me I should I, I might be misrepresenting myself here. I had never read any of those, but I okay, knew about a lot of ideas from those books because I had friends who were big Star Wars fans who would talk about No, I understand about what that. they said. Yeah. And they were fans of it. There was a pretty big fan base yeah, for that kind yeah. of stuff. And then the problem is then the, the subsequent movies came out and they're not as popular. It, yeah, it, it, you have to leave it to like almost the series. I mean, it, it works so much better as like series, like TV series over uh, movies, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Like, OK, so one of the things I used to say back in the day, like if someone says, do you do you like Star Wars or Star Trek? I'd be like, well, here's what I could say about Star Wars. I've seen that. I haven't seen Star Trek because I'm not going to sit down for a series about them sitting around a command deck talking about philosophy. Like, I don't want to <laughs> like, but but that's actually not bad. Like, it's Star Trek, especially like Next Generation, from what I've heard. I Again, I haven't really seen it. Super well written. It's just kind of low budget. So there really isn't a lot of special effects or action. It's much more political in that sense. Whereas like um, Star Wars is big budget big action scenes it's a lot of and they added a fantasy mumbo jumbo magic shit that's going on the force who knows what that is that's crazy and then george lucas goes it's metachlorians and it's like all right well it's bacteria i guess um but like it, it's more in your face and more accessible because it's movies movies are a lot less of a time investment so it's like i could say i've seen star wars but i wasn't a huge fan at first because i'm like well they're kind of all over the place right like the the original trilogy is good, but it's kind of slow. It's they're older movies; they had a different pacing. And then the prequels are are also really like colorful and cool, but they're like they feel like they take place in a completely different universe. Like it says yeah. it's Star Wars, but Coruscant, there's nothing like that in the original trilogy. Like there's no yeah. metropolitan thing. I mean, the most metropolitan place is Tatooine, you know. And that's like yeah. a desert backwater world. Like it's not, it doesn't feel like this busy lived in universe like it did in like these other movies. Um, yeah. They don't have like the bar scene or they don't, or it's, it's not the same the way that the bar scene yeah. works between like a new hope and, and um, in the prequels. Yeah. I guess I'm rambling a little bit. I, I, all, all I mean to say is that like 
the the movies seem to have all these different it's pulling it in all these different directions and it wasn't until they started coming out with like the mandalorian and like clone wars the series where they're written by nerds who read the expanded universe and even after it got decanonized they could pick and choose those so which things to bring into the canon so like yeah general uh not tark there's like a admiral uh blue face blue man there's a blue guy Oh, oh yeah oh my god it's 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 thrawn it's, it's thrawn, thrawn or... it's thrawn yeah, yeah yeah admiral thrawn okay so admiral thrawn is a huge villain in like the extended universe and when they decanonized it everyone was upset oh no thrawn was so great well the fans who read that stuff who are working on the shows you know could talk with the authors and the property owners of thrawn as like a character and were able to get him in as like a a villain so they were able to reintroduce elements from the books to bring them back into the canon so like i like the series the show because that is more accessible than reading a book sorry to say it folks if you like reading uh not no not knocking it but i can wa- i can sit and watch mandalorian and that's way more interesting watching a dude who i can't see his face with a little <laughs> muppet <laughs> than reading a book is you know that's way more endearing yeah. to me um mm-hmm. but i get to i get to learn more about that stuff uh you know mm-hmm. through that. yeah i've i've been a, a pretty big fan of or um i haven't so the thing is is that i started on the mandalorian and we haven't had a chance to like catch up mm. to the later like mandalorians and i think it's uh there's the um book of boba no, fett sorry not solo it's the the book of Bo- okay let's let's go through them there's the book of boba fett there's the um kenobi and That's then right, there's yeah. i think the what is it the the rebellion i think there's a uh, one yes oh uh andoran or a- andoran andor andor think, right? yeah 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 so i have not seen those ones so i haven't fully caught up with it but like i remember watching mandalorian and being like a huge fan of it yeah. um yeah, but it's it's interesting because like um, I so I managed to run the run the campaign in the Star Wars universe, but like after having run it, I'm like eh, I kind of did it the ones I don't know if I want to play in that universe again. I might play with those rules, but it's like the idea was is that their characters and the plot line is going on at the same time, and we're gonna have time travel shenanigans, and they're gonna be able to I- interact with the characters whatever they want, and then blah blah blah, and it. It's it's so tough working with like an IP because mm-hmm. those characters already have their story. So when the players meet them, they already have an impression of like how they're going to act and who they think and stuff like that. But in addition, like sometimes like some of the players are huge fans of these characters like, oh, my God, it's so and so. And then sometimes you meet someone who's like, uh, this is like I met them once, like I wasn't a big fan. They're OK. They're cool, but they're not like stoked to see them. Yeah. Um, and it's it's also like you know it like it it feels a little bit creatively like kind of difficult in terms of it's it's very constraining because they players know that they have their own storyline and they know they have their own stuff and so the the past while i've been running a a new can i've had two new campaigns that i've played before in like okay uh I, I'm I'm not doing an, an IP or anything. We're gonna go away. We're gonna do something else, and and that's been a lot of fun to have that creative freedom again. I might want to play in another IP again, but like it'll be a while before I want to. You made a very ballsy decision in our game to do time oh, travel. Like that's I, so hard to accomplish. <laughs> oh, it was great. It was great. It was great. I actually did really like the time travel thing. Um, but yeah, I get it because the problem is is that. I had to be like literally out of character telling people how the time travel worked because it's like, what the fuck is going on? Like, why is any of this happening the way it is? And I'm like, okay, guys, this is what's going on. Just so you understand, we have two separate links. This person is from a different alternate version that is blah 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 and stuff like that so that was that was the only way i could get that to work yeah i i will I'll say i remember the reveal of going back to tatooine and having the empire there and being like what the fuck oh, huh God. that shouldn't be there <laughs> that so, was yeah the so that was so cool of a reveal like when you were like, no, yeah, thanks. things are different. It's like the Empire is still around. Like, that's weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the thing is, and I, I've run into this in Call of Cthulhu, where sometimes what happens is I give the players an inconsistency, and I think I'm giving them a clue, 
but they're trying to read me as a GM. Like, did Ben just like accidentally uh, yeah. like say something? Like, there was there was one time the players talk to two witnesses and they get a different story from each witness. And they're like, oh, Ben just forgot that one witness told us that the car was blue and this one says it's red. And I'm like, no, I I'm giving you a clue that like there's an inconsistency. So they yeah. had gone to Tatooine was a certain way, left, come back. And at first they thought that I like Maybe he wants to change the campaign up a little bit. Maybe he wants to like change yeah. something. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I will say that he, wasn't me. I wasn't saying that. That was your friends saying like, yeah, Ben yeah. made a mistake. Uh, <laughs> 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 I was like, wait a minute. Maybe this was on purpose. Maybe we should investigate. Like, nah, nah, Ben, Ben. Then screwed this up or something. That's all right, Ben. You want to change it? You you don't have to tell us. <laughs> I okay, like, I have two. I have two friends who have a more realistic <laughs> idea of me as a GM. No, I'm just <laughs> I was like, gosh, you guys are ruthless. Uh, that was that was so fun though. Um, no, I and uh, I really liked. Um, I really liked the characters we all decided to choose to play. Like I thought that that was very. It was interesting. We all were small characters. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How that worked out. Yeah, yeah. Cause I don't think we had a conversation beforehand. I think, I think we just ended up being small. I'm like, wait a minute. Are none of us medium size? Wait a minute. None of us are. In fact, I'm tiny. I'm the only tiny size creature. That's weird. Okay. All right. Let's do something with that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it was interesting also in terms of like, trying to figure out because i i know that the i think the group was a lot like on a morally gray scale was more to the darker side yeah. in terms of like like we get the job done like we don't care how it gets done but we're gonna we're gonna end it <laughs> yeah we were definitely i it's we're very morally gray that's a great way to put it very morally gray. Like, I, I said as much as Obliax, like, I want to rule the galaxy, but in favor of the small races that get stepped on by these bigger races. They don't got anybody to represent them. I could be that representative. I could be that emperor. Using those words, like, a new empire under me, you know, like, yeah, very yeah. fun. But, like, Obliax had, a, I would say, very... Uh, hmm lawful in his own way i guess like he had his own sort of code of ethics he was honest about what he wanted he didn't use deception or deceit like the sith like to do as much uh only when it was like for survival purposes generally like to be very upfront and and like out there with his his the, goals the way the way that i um attribute it to is that if, if there's someone who's going to try and kill you or something you're okay lying with them but like if you're making a deal with someone who's an ally you don't lie to your allies like yeah you you're very upfront and frank about loyalty like, this and is trust deal. is important for a burgeoning emperor you know like <laughs> yeah yeah but it's like if there's someone on the on the street who's who's like trying to assassinate you like you're not gonna you don't feel some bond of loyalty to them yeah i don't owe them any favors that's for sure yeah yeah but yeah uh um anyway like the 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 game was very fun uh did you have any regrets when you ran that game like anything that didn't go the way that you wanted it to go or like it completely blew up and you're like ah, oh, this isn't this isn't good and you had to sort of like double uh, back or do something different it's it was interesting because um so thinking back i was very happy with all the characters and how everyone played and stuff i think the main thing is i did like the time travel um so yeah surprisingly that worked out really well um i did actually there were several moments where the players like where you did have that cinematic like uh players lose or something bad happens and then they have to go back in time and like fix it oh yeah and, i forgot about the loop oh my god yeah there was a loop that involved the fact that there was a bomb that went off, two of the characters died, and then they had to go back in time to, like, fix it. And so now they're going into this fight, and they have several other people going into it. You also had uh, some of the villains were, like, alternate versions of them that had, like, in a different timeline, taken a different route. Um, the So that the time travel itself worked fine. It's just the fact that it's now... Um, and originally, like, a, a big part of the reason I was doing that was because I was like, that is so that way it's because the characters, you as players know what the plot line goes down. And so it's like, so that way you can have the meta knowledge 
of like how all this stuff went. Like that's an excuse for like because normally let's say that it's set in like the prequels area and it's like, well, how, you know, my character knows that it's going to fall to the Empire. Like, how does my character know this? And it's like, well, the reason that, you know, is because you're actually from the future and you went back in the past, you know, mm -hmm. so that's that's how you can have that meta knowledge that, you know, that this event is going to take place here. Um, the the issue, though, I think, is that I like I wanted the players to have a lot more flexibility with how they approach the problems in terms of like, oh, they're able to like change the narrative and stuff like that. But the problem is that like the players know at the end of it that everything just goes back to normal. Like it's it's it, or everything that happens as bad as it is needs to happen for things to be fixed. Right. And the thing is, is that there's not like there's an, like and so the plot line is about them going back and fixing the the time but they didn't have the same flexibility in terms of like oh what if we did things a different way and it's i, I think that that's often a problem with like time travel stories is that it's all about fixing things so that your returns to normal you're trying to get back to situation normal mm -hmm. because you know that as bad as things were they work out in the end and um I, I don't know. It was like in my head, I thought saw it as like this big open world adventure where it's like, oh, you can go back and forth in time. And it really wasn't that because like, OK, you go back to the prequels era. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to kill Emperor Palpatine? You know, right. But like he's kind of <laughs> necessary, like for everything that happens. Right. And then you as the DM would then have to figure out, OK, well, you killed the emperor. Now I have to write a whole AU of Star Wars where the Emperor died way early, what happens? Cause an, you'd have to write a whole novel at that point. I, I was actually okay with that. I was actually <laughs> okay looking forward to, guess what? What happens if the Emperor isn't there? Or something like that. But it's, the from the player's perspective, it's just like, uh, well, what if what if things are worse? And actually, that was totally what I was going to do. It was going to be like, ah, oh, the Emperor's dead. Everything's worse now. Yeah. You have this, like... <laughs> the what is it the um the senate has become like super corrupt and like taken over everything and it's like oh we need the emperor well yeah because i mean that like his big thing was consolidating power and eliminating rivals right so like a lot of innocents got in the crosshairs but a lot of other really bad folks that were not on his side also got taken out by him because that's how he got his power right so like yeah in a way he took out the trash for us and then you take out the emperor <laughs> after that point and then you can have a free galaxy <laughs> you yeah. sort of have to let but, him do the hard work there <laughs> yeah. but it, anyway it's it like and, there, and oh my god the problem is once we're going down the hole there's a ton of interpretation of like who was the good guy who was the bad guy what was necessary what is not necessary because i know mm -hmm. that that was debated in the comments which i don't want to get into but <laughs> like <laughs> like what would happen if luke skywalker became evil or something like that right but um anyway the um i i, I still was decently happy with it but it's um it made me kind of not want like if i play in an ip the problem is i'm like ah i don't know if i want to go like if the players go to Hogwarts, I'm like, okay, maybe they, all right, that's fine. But like, I don't want Harry Potter to be there and Ron and Hermione and shit. Yeah, then yeah. They're like, what? They're going off and doing their normal adventure at the same time. That was, so that was something that I, I felt like both campaigns fell into, but you at least went full tilt into it. So like when I played um, the first Star Wars campaign with my other friend group, in my head, I wanted to have nothing to do with the Force and nothing to do with the the main characters. I wanted to have our own smuggling adventures out in space. I wanted it to not be related to the main story because it's a big galaxy. We shouldn't have to meet all these characters. But, of course, my DM could not resist <laughs> throwing Luke fucking Skywalker somewhere in there. I was like, cool, awesome. Uh, I knew this was going to happen. Yeah, I'm playing an IG unit, uh, a fucking droid that's just like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> and I don't <laughs> care because I am not force sensitive. Um, and then I, uh, with yours, you were like, well, so 
yeah, they all exist in time and someone's fucking up time and you just happen to be at the right place at the right time with the right tools to be able to fix it. So really, you're the only ones that can do it. Uh, so you're going to have to meet those characters. That felt better because then it, mm-hmm. it was about that. It was about us fixing time instead of... Uh, by the way, Luke is there. You know, like, just randomly. Oh, yeah. There's, like, if Luke's there, like, what? It's like, oh, hi. Like, you wave to him as he passes by going off on his yeah, mission. No or shade something. to my friend, by the way. He's, yeah. he's great. He's a great yeah. dude. I just, that was one of those things where it's like, of course you're going to put him there. <laughs> you know, okay. I rolled my eyes. I think, I think, okay, I think I got it. I think if I were to do another Star Wars campaign, I would do an alternate universe where, like, it's, it's effectively, like, um... Uh, I'm trying to think like there's no Luke Skywalker there's no Darth Vader there's none of that like ignore all of that it's just there's Jedi or you have force sensitive people but they they have a separate interpretation in the same way that if you have a homebrew D&D game and I have a homebrew D&D game like we don't share any characters between them kind of a thing mm-hmm. like it's just another fantasy universe that happens to operate on the same rules right well yeah I mean like when you play curse of strahd right you're playing your version yeah. of that that adventure so other yeah. people's curse of strahd games are not going to be connected right it's yeah uh, you know with and that's with all sort of like modules and stuff it's one of the reasons i like modules and makes them replayable yeah. is that the npcs are the same usually they're like the same characters maybe played a little differently some people might be dropped some other extra people might be added but for the most part it's the the structure the the scaffolding is there and then the characters create a completely new interpretation of what that story could be. And to me, yeah. that is so fascinating. It's mm-hmm. uh, I love that. Yeah. And Star Wars, though, even though you both were homebrewing different things for your own purposes, because it's Star Wars, it still feels like the, the events of the movies are canon. So everyone's operating off of that same universal structure, you know, yeah. uh, that all happened in both universes. And now... There's a story, a what if story of these characters, right? Yeah. Also, uh, so I have uh, three other campaigns that I've run since that time. Let's, yeah, um, let's change it up. I'm sure th- those of us uh, who love Star Wars are loving hearing about this. Some of us who don't play it that are like, can we move on to D&D? Let's hear about mm-hmm. it. What are your other campaigns? You're okay. In? So um, what I did was I ran, um, this is, uh, so I ran Waterdeep Dragon Heist for, Ooh. I think, the... So I ran it for a few sessions, and then I ran a full campaign, and then I ran another full campaign. So this this is going to be my second and a half time running Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Oh, cool. Um, and then immediately after that, I ran um, a Feywild campaign. So it, it I think I ran it over like nine months, and, and still technically it's on hiatus. Um, and then immediately after that, I ran a Pathfinder 2nd Edition game uh in a sandbox uh homebrew world called Rorg. Hmm. Um so starting with uh Waterdeep Dragon Heist. I'm by uh, the way, uh, if there's any spoilers, should we do a spoiler warning or will you give us a warning before you get into plot relevant stuff? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or actually uh if that's the case, um I think I will try and keep it as spoiler free as I can. Okay. All right. The discussion. Okay. Um so the the thing is is that in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, uh the first time I ran it, I ran it like by the book. Like, okay, this is what it says and this is what we're going to do. And then there are certain sections where it really drags. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. oh my, like uh, not paced well. Yeah. yeah. Not paced well. And so um I ended up the and it was like it was okay, but it wasn't like what I was looking. That's not what I expected out mm-hmm. of a book called Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Second time I ran it, um I said the problem is, is that I had like two players who had played it before. And so I was like, well, I can't like, I can't have a lot of the same stuff. Cause there's like, there's like, Ooh, these like little secrets and stuff. But it's like, well, if they already know what the secrets are, I'm going to have to move them or change them or something like that. And then in addition, I didn't want to have certain, like the, the sections that drag. So I changed it. I was like, okay, it's going to be free form. Um, and I, Loved it. It was great. We played it for a certain number of months. And I even did like part of a write up for it because I was considering doing a long form like what I did with the Curse of Strahd game where it's like a a replay series. And I wrote it. I wrote most of it. Um, And then I just kind of got burnt out and then stopped. But I I have like I'm like 40,000 words into it or something like that. Hmm. Um, It's 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 quite a long thing. So 
that was Waterdeep Dragon Heist. Uh, should I talk about the second one, or do you have anything you want to talk about with any question? Because we could stop here and talk about the Waterdeep before moving Well, on I've never two. played Waterdeep Dragon Heist. I have the book um, yeah. uh, that was bought for me as a gift, but I don't... I, like, I purposefully don't go through the modules if I think I'm going to play oh, through Oh, I them. understand. Yeah, yeah, And yeah, I yeah. kind of... Okay. Part of me wants to play through it first as a player to get that perspective before I read through and try to DM it on my own, if that makes sense. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think there is there's one thing I kind of want to talk about, which is a little bit spoilery. Um, I don't know if I want to because there, there, the problem is, is that there's a way that you can talk about it where you don't give away too many details of like, oh, this is how the story structure is. But it's like, well, if you tell someone the story structure, then it's like and we're playing kind of it. Can, it can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Predict it. Yeah. OK. So but yeah, it's uh, and the the other thing is that there are. um and once again, not trying to be too spoilery. The thing is that the way that the module is written, there are these certain things that are in the city that don't interact with the players. And the reason they don't interact with the players is because they're not part of the central plot line. It's like, okay, there are these things that are in the city, these these actors that have nothing to do with players. And there's actually a lot of supplemental materials that have been published over the years to try and get the the players more interacting with the city as a whole instead of just these smaller sections of it. They're trying to work ever, all this material into the actual storyline. And a big part of the problem is that there are some like actors and there are certain events and stuff like that where it's like, well, these, this is like 15, 16, 17th level and the players are like levels one to five, you know? And sometimes people just <laughs> power scale the, the characters and just be like, okay, whatever, you're 10th level and you're in water deep and stuff like that. Right. Yeah, so it, it has a little bit of, uh, and I, I fully understand what they're saying, because like when they wrote the book, they're like, oh, they're like these 20th level characters would be running around the city and 15th level characters. And it's like, but the characters are first level. So like, <laughs> yeah, I guess it's it's almost like putting in DMPCs, you know, like, look at these like nods to old books and old adventures that we put in here, all these recognizable names and faces that you're going to have nothing to do with because you're not high enough level. Yeah. 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 So I so yeah, I, I did enjoy the second time that I ran it more where it's like it really felt like you got to feel the full city, you know, in a way mm -hmm. and kind of incorporate a lot of these like wish lists of like the first time you played, I had like a wish list of like, ah, uh, like I wish we would have done A, B, C, D, E. And then like now that I ran it again, I got to get my my full wish list of stuff, you know, involved in the plot line. So that was great. Yeah. I I, I yeah. mean, that's one of the my favorite parts of uh modules too is that after you've run it like at least once and had a little experience with it you know exactly where its shortcomings are and you're like okay i know how to make this better and you can add your own spices and make it your own recipe you know what i mean yeah so that was water deep i think that's all i'm going to talk about just so that way i don't go into spoiler territory yeah sure 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 hopefully hopefully that was as general as i can be <laughs> you know to, but the um, then we're talking about the the next game, the homebrew game that I'd run in the Feywild, and what the plot line for that one was is that um, so you have kind of each of the different Eladrin courts, and you have kind of the um, main court that is run by Oberon, and the plot line is about that this this one particular summer there's a set of these games that happen, and if you win one of the games, you get a seat on the council. Like you become one of the council members and the game is hide and seek. <laughs> and the idea is that if you catch someone, if someone goes into hiding and they hide for a certain period of time, they re re keep their seat on the council. But if they lose, then you get whoever catches them gets their seat. Interesting. Um, and so it's the idea is that each of the courts are trying to find people who are hiding as council members. And also Oberon has gone. He just like he fucks off because he's he's part of the game, too. So he leaves. So if someone catches Oberon, they they become the the crown. Wow. And the idea is that in the Feywild, they've been playing these games and Oberon has lost a seat before, but then reclaimed it in the past. <laughs> and so he's just good at playing these games. And that's why he's won uh, several years in a row. But um the and so the plot line is is basically around each of these different factions are either vying for control or trying to win these games to get power um the main villain uh or antagonist of the campaign is the winter court of eladrin 
who are kind of like the Winter Witch and stuff like that, who want right. to uh, shroud the the Feywild in snow, you know, and it's uh, each of the Eladra and they get their power from the weather. And so um, depending on what the weather is, that's their influence of control. And the, the reason that the other Eladrin are, are asking the players to help them is because they can't go into the winter area to like do anything because they lose their power if they go into any area where the weather affects right, them. Yeah. So because each one is is seasonally based and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's the plot line that's that's going on there. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, was there anything else? One of the players became a council member because they found someone who was hiding and it's it's the most like naive innocent guy of the group his name is og and he's like oh hi guys okay and he like always tries <laughs> to talk to people any of the monsters before fighting them um but yeah and it's um yeah vying for control uh they're trying to find oberon and then also part of the plot line is that one of the major villains has captured titania and Ooh. they the and is is threatening to kill her and the reason is is because they're thinking that this is going to flush oberon out of hiding and so now from oberon's standpoint he's got to find a way to try and get titania back without while, directly without doing anything himself. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's actually really interesting i like that yeah so that's what's been happening in the feywild campaign um <laughs> and then um the the next one that i play so that was also fifth so funny thing that one started off as a savage worlds game and then we switched to doing dungeons and dragons fifth edition um interesting so, so are you familiar at all with savage worlds i think you might you've mentioned it to me before but i don't quite remember any of the details okay so savage worlds is another um rpg system and the way i'm trying to think of the best way to describe it i i would describe it as like gurps light where the idea is that it wanted to be a it wants to be the pitch for it is that it's a simple system where you have this one source book and then you have other books supplemental books that go on top of it where the base savage worlds is like it makes your bare bones character really simple and then there's like oh if you're playing a fantasy world you put the fantasy supplement on top of it and then that gives you spells and abilities and stuff like that and it's also a lot of the base system is incredibly generic where it's like you'll have a character who has an ability called um like binding attack what does it do it binds up a character and then it's like if you're playing in a fantasy setting you say well, I'm a druid and I'm casting Entangle on them and it does a bind effect. But if you're playing in a science setting, it's like, oh, this is like I have a clawed robot and it's doing a binding attack or something mm, like that. I see. Um, and it's it's designed to be really simple. Um, and uh, the other major, uh, the other, so the other major feature about it is the fact that the dice system, it uses D4 to D12. And those are the dice that you roll for your skill checks is just you if if you're the worst you roll a d4 if you're the best you roll a d12 so it's on a one to five scale and then in addition the um a four is considered a, a success so if you're rolling the d4 that means that you're going to succeed only on a four. Oh, interesting if you're rolling a d6 you succeed on four five six you know stuff like that so it's it's really interesting really simple uh very easy to teach um the the other thing is that the character creation is a hundred is so flexible like we we had like one of the um players was like oh i want to play a cleric but i want to be a cleric that like is sneaky and can like steal things and the base stats have nothing to do with the skills so it's like just put ranks in healing and you put ranks in stealth and there you go you're a yeah. sneaky healer you know <laughs> i like that and so that's that, good yeah and that, that flexibility was like really cool um the the weird part okay so there's a few things that are like like really really fucking weird about this system you don't take damage there's no damage in this what happens is that you have like a vitality whatever your constitution is when you get hit and it has a damage number you do a constitution check against the damage number and then if you uh fail it then you get injured so if you have a character that's really tanky what they do is they just make these like the con saves and then they could be, take like no damage but then if you're someone who's like a wizard you just make these constitution checks and if you 
heck it up three times, then you go down, you know, if, yeah. if you get three fails, then you're down. And so it's um, like that aspect was like really interesting. But whenever I when I was teaching new players, it was like such a like so hard to like try and communicate to new players because it's like the first one staggers you. And then the second ones, you actually take damage because the first hit that you take is like a gimme. It's like, OK, it does nothing. But right. then the subsequent hits, you actually get a penalty to your rolls and a penalty to your subsequent saves. Um, So like if you're at like minus three, I think is is a thing, then that means you have a minus three to all your rolls and you have minus three to all your damage checks and stuff like that. So it's oh. it's pretty punishing to actually take damage in that game. I see. That's kind of. Well, I guess it's not really. I was thinking Warrior World. Uh, I don't know if you or Warrior Land. If you've ever played the Warrior Land series, you're invincible in that, and when you get hit, you lose coins, but you need coins to get treasure, and treasure is oh, how you advance in that game. So, like, uh, you can get hit and hit and hit until you lose all your coins and still get hit and not die. But like, that's still bad for like different reasons than dying. So yeah. I, it reminds mm -hmm. me of that loosely. Mm -hmm yeah it's um yeah so it was an interesting system it's the the part actually so and that was really cool um the the thing is is that the the combat actually turned out to be relatively complicated like as as simple as it is to make characters there's a lot of fiddly little modifiers that get involved with like various mm, abilities like uh I and see. then if the other thing is that because it uses a d6 system, if someone has a minus three, that's really punishing. That's really punishing. It's really you know? bad. Yeah, that's um, huge. But, yeah. And it was also part of the thing is that um, we like uh, I forget it, it, the way that it had worked is we had let character like you could make up your own race and then add your class on top of it and other abilities and stuff like that. And the the min-maxing, like, the difference between the characters was, like, really staggering, where you'd have one character who's, like, running through all these encounters, can't get hurt, can't get hit, and they have another character who's just, like, a stiff wit breeze, like, knocks mm -hmm. them over. <laughs> yeah. But it's... Yeah, and so it was always very difficult to, like, try and balance for those two kind of characters, because it's, like... God damn, this guy's got a hit for like 25 damage. But if I connect with 25 damage on one of these guys, it's just going to instantly kill them, you know? Right. It's, yeah. So you made the transition back to 5e because yeah, of, yeah. Yeah. Just the we familiarity, like, people know what they need to survive in 5e. It's not like yeah. a mystery. Oh, high con's going to give you good hit points. High dex is going to give you good AC. It's kind of, there it is. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. It was, <laughs> It was familiar, and I did kind of want to go back to that system. So we we did it. We did fifth edition, um, and then I played it. I think uh, that campaign, the Fey Wild campaign, for about nine months, um, and then I had taken a break for a little bit. And then, like three months down the line, I was like, actually. So what's funny is it was when they were doing like the OSR stuff and the conversation they were talking about, like, and even a little bit before it, I was like, I kind of want to get back into playing some RPGs and stuff, but. I told my group like, hey, I'm just I'm not really feeling fifth edition. You know, I played it for like, what, six, eight years, something like that. Yeah. I kind of want to play run like something else or I want to take a break. Oh, I forgot about this. And the the thing is, is that the group said that they wanted something that was a little bit complicated, like they want or they want something that's like technical, you know, Crunchy, like yeah. I was like. Because, like, sometimes when I play, I'm, like, okay with, like, an index sheet of, like, a character. Like, I just, I'm a fighter. There we go. Pop. There we go. There's my stats. I'm good to go. Whereas they're, like, we want to, like, pick weapons and pick abilities and, and be able to synergize and stuff like that. So they actually want something with, like, a little bit more meat on it. Um, and so, uh, and so the compromise that we, <laughs> this is the dumbest compromise. The compromise we came to <laughs> was we played Pathfinder First Edition. <laughs> um but Woo. it was god the so part of it also was because i was nostalgic for pathfinder first edition because that was the, one of the first ones that i ran yeah. and we had another friend we had two other friends who had either played it or they were like nostalgic for it and they're like oh we kind of want to like try it again it's like okay we'll play pathfinder first edition and uh so do you have an experience with pathfinder first edition oh that was my first system i played a lot of games okay. in the first first edition pathfinder i loved it uh i mm -hmm. recognize it's a bit of a nightmare to build a character or even level leveling up takes like an hour in that fucking edition mm. 
Um, but so, I do love it. Uh, but well, yeah, yeah. let's hear let's hear your, <laughs> your experience with that. So the first problem that I realized um, is that like my particular group and times had changed in the last like eight years or so in that play, my players really wanted to have an online like character builder. And there's like one or two of out there. They're not great. Um, and the thing they really wanted, like a and d Beyond for Pathfinder first edition. I'm like, we, that that doesn't exist you know Sadly. like yeah and uh and the problem is the characters are very complicated you know there's a lot of stuff going in there um and it's like each of the different abilities and like you'll you'll take a look at a power and it's a paragraph long and you're like this isn't that big of a deal like i can keep track of this you know it has these variable bonuses i can keep track of that but then you add like two or three then you add something else and then you add another effect and then suddenly it's like it is completely unmanageable, you know, and the mm -hmm. problem is that I, I the where I, I knew it was starting to come undone is that the players came in with our characters and they had built it. And I was like, I can't verify if any of the stuff on their sheets correct. You know, this person comes in and says their AC is like, you know, a 15 or something like that. I don't know if that's correct. Like I would have to go line by line on their character sheet to verify that they did that correctly. I can't verify that. And they're even telling me, like, I think this is all wrong, but I don't know. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a story about, like, that sort of nightmare. I um, actually told the D&D &D story on my channel about uh, uh, Prospero. He was a sorcerer, but uh, the subclass for them was uh, that I took was Sage, where you could use your intelligence like a wizard instead of charisma. An intelligence-based sorcerer. And... Uh, they were very overconfident. They ended up killing somebody by accident because they thought that they would be able to dodge out of the way of this. Like they had a, a rod of mercy where they could add the mercy trait to any of their spells. So make a non-lethal damage. And then they maxed out a lightning bolt or yeah, no, it was uh they had a meta magic for mercy, merciful spell. And then they had a rod of maximize. So they maximize a lightning bolt, hit a, hit a character. They did not dodge, even though they were rogue, they couldn't dodge. They were grappled or whatever. Uh, were flat footed and they uh died straight up it was enough non-lethal damage that it just outright killed them and then uh, my lawful good character had to grapple with that like oh god i didn't calculate the numbers right literally the same session my character walked into a chamber and this like kung fu boxing mummy like shot up to me and three hit killed me just boom boom, boom. flurry blows me until i died in like one round without any of my uh other guys around to to help me out so we mm -hmm. made new characters. Uh, he made a cleric and I made a paladin. When I was putting my paladin together and doing exactly what you're talking about, putting all those bonuses on attacks together, we because we leveled up to 20 for the end. We were fighting like Orcus, uh, the demon, you know, lord of the undead. And we're, we're in the abyss uh, in this like palace as we're fighting Orcus. And I've got this paladin and I'm like, I'm looking at an index card where it's like, this plus this plus this plus this plus this probably like eight integers all together that have to get added to give me what I actually add to my uh, d20 roll. Um, and any if any one thing isn't right, I have to I have to make on the spot oh, calculations for every hit. So it was ridiculous. And that's just a hit. Then there's the damage. And the damage is a whole other story because then you've got all these other abilities that tell you what the damage is supposed to be. Oh, but that guy's got uh, a resistance to that. Well, then we got to calculate that and blah, blah, blah. Everybody's turn it took 10 minutes just to get these calculations out of the way before someone else could take their turn. It was a nightmare at level 20 because of yeah. all of the number crunching. Yeah, and I even even just looking at like the crits, like trying to explain to my players the fact that crits vary by weapon. And mm -hmm. that, like, this one's a times three, but it's 17 to nine, you know, 17 to 20. And this one's like a times two. And this one, and you have to roll 19, to confirm, 20, so. too. So it's like, even oh, yeah. if you rolled high, yeah. you still have to do a confirmation roll to see if it is a crit or not. I tried to explain to my players, like, four or five ways why we're doing concentration or um, confirmation. And they I still, to this day, I don't think they fully understand it. And I'm like, the confirmation exists so that way you don't crit a god. And it's like, well, why can't you? It's like, well, it's like, you got to confirm. It's so that way you don't accidentally do it. It's like, but I want to. 
like <laughs> it's it's because crits are a lot e- like they're more powerful in first edition pathfinder and they're easier to get like you said you can crit on as low as a 17 i think for a lot of stuff i think actually as low as a 15 if you build it right you can get a crit as low as a 15 on your die Meaning, if you were critting on everything 15 and above, you'd be critting like every hit. And that yeah. can be ridiculous in that game. So they do the confirmation rules to just give a, a second pass to make sure that uh, you're not critting as often with these powerful crits as you would normally. However, it's just an extra step. So like in Pathfinder 2E, they realize we're not doing that again. <laughs> Yeah, they might extend the range of the crit, but they're not going to make the crits nearly as devastating. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we did that. Uh, so we started there. You know, we had a lot of issues with the character. And it was the other issue that I realized is that a lot of times when we're playing like fifth edition, we actually rely on our friends to like have a perfect knowledge of the game where it's like, oh, I'm going to do fireball damage. How much is fireball damage? And it's like, oh, 8d6. And mm-hmm. like, okay, and you'd pick up the 8d6 and you roll it. Whereas, and then like, oh, if I heighten it to 10, like how much damage does it do? It's like, oh, it's, you know, like six plus three, you know, or something like, like someone does the math and then it just tells you. Whereas like in, when you're playing first edition, it's like, well, how much does this ability do? And it's like, you got to look that up. You know, everybody has to look up everything. Yeah. yeah and, um, and having to like stop and kind of look everything up on constantly is, is a bit of a pain. And just the difference in, Oh my god. How many times this has happened where there's two paragraphs to a spell. The first paragraph p- tells you the damage and what it does and the second paragraph is all the conditional stuff like you're not able to do this spell while in water or you're not allowed to do this spell if blah blah blah. Everyone yeah. always misses that second paragraph. <laughs> they always yeah. just read the first paragraph, they read the damage, they roll the damage, you know. And then it's like, you got to stop. And it's like, wait, second paragraph. Um, and actually, it's I had that same problem because we um, one of the characters would make a samurai. And it was like, I, for, I forget, we we found a So, oh, my God. OK, so <laughs> <laughs> I, this is a story I have to back up. We were going to play Pathfinder first edition. We said, we'll not do anything too crazy. We're not going to do anything too weird. We're just going to make the most words. normal characters. <laughs> We're just going to make yeah, normal for... characters. Uh-huh, but then uh-huh. someone's like, hey, I want to play a bird race, but like not quite the one in the book. And it's like, well, that's fine. We can use the custom race builder. What the custom race builder is not on this particular thing. That's fine. We can do it this way and upload a custom brew. And then suddenly, you know, you're several hours into it. And then now... And then at the end, we like shoot, um, my girlfriend wanted to play as a samurai, but there were no samurai loaded onto this particular character gen thing. So we had to do everything manually. And the last paragraph I missed of one of her abilities, because she's playing the samurai that's the traditional heavy armor like that, like the face mask, the big head thing and like, you know, and and so that kind of samurai. And then like we read through, we got all of the abilities, we got everything set it out and we missed the last line we found out the last line of text like one minute before we're gonna play you cannot use any of these abilities in heavy or medium armor you can only use them in light armor or like robes because it yeah that particular class was like the the robed samurai that wears a kimono and like busts out a katana and it's like the dueling class kind of a thing um but and so you're like okay just take off the armor we had put all of her ranks out of decks and into strength because it was like, oh, you're going to be like someone who wields a katana and because you're big and burly, yeah. you can wear the heavy armor. <laughs> so now it's an entire top to bottom. That one paragraph is an entire top to bottom character remake that we got to do. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, why not just be a monk if it's going to do that as a subclass, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, I, that. That's rough. That's so but, rough having to rebuild your character last minute but, because of a stipulation that you missed. But I will tell you, there's some stuff in Pathfinder 1E that was really cool. It was really cool. Oh, like, yeah. so first, the fact that you get to min max or that it lets you, like, it gives the player a certain freedom that, like, other games don't have where they're like, oh, we don't want it to be too broken. This is just like, fuck it. You get whatever you want, you know? <laughs> and then the second thing is that, like, 
So a character specializes and they're really good at one thing, but terrible at other things. That means that like you'll have like a sneaky rogue who like stabs, but they're not going around with like 25 AC or something like that. Or if they are, they're like, there's like the it's like characters are really good at one thing and then they suck at everything else. And so there's some really harsh weaknesses, whereas in some games, it's kind of like they mitigate some of the weaknesses like uh, like in in D&D, everyone will have an AC of like 16. Everyone's just tanky, you know, yeah. and then some will be a little bit more tanky here. Like I've seen some real big like someone's min maxing AC and it's like a huge difference between someone who's not min maxing AC, you know. Right. Yeah. And then um, the other thing was, is that we had a fight with snakes and in I know how they work in fifth edition. It's like they bite, they do poison damage, maybe they poison and they do a little bit of hit point damage. Snakes and vipers in uh pathfinder they hit and they do just like one or two piercing damage and then they do constitution damage yep you know and then you lower your constitution animals in first edition pathfinder are are like monsters they're they're not they're not animals they're monsters like they badgers i I, have i ever told you the badger story no Oh, the badger. Okay, so I when I first started playing, I played Lim Duel the Necromancer based on the magic card. Uh, he was uh, I, he was sort of a, a my edge lord character. I wanted to play. I wanted to play someone who could create undead and, and have like an army that follows him. And I, that was my that was my fantasy at the time. Well, that was swiftly undone when we were camping and trying to hunt. I had like a hunting trap, so I was like trying to hunt for food so we could have food out in the wild. And because, uh, you know, going into towns with all your skeletons is kind of an issue. And I came across a badger that tripped the trap. So I was like, cool, I'm going to try to kill the badger. The badger gnawed off its own leg and went into rage like a barbarian, called for its like uh, its brethren, like its other badger friends. Uh, so it spawned like four more badgers and they all raged and brought me down to two hit points in like a round. And oh, I God. had to I had to climb a tree, which I had very bad stats. I was poorly statted out because we rolled for stats. Um, and I was using channel negative energy to just blast the life out of these badgers that didn't quit because they were in a rage. They weren't scared away. They were raging. So they were trying to gnaw and claw up the tree to fucking end my life. And I'm calling for I'm like, ah, help, help. And our <laughs> ranger came by and was like trying to snipe them. And they got downed by the badgers. And I was like, these things are s- from hell. They're <laughs> Satan's little fucking dogs. Kill them. It was it was time. Uh, yeah. And I learned that animals in Pathfinder, they're not animals. They are demons. They're just that strong. And you always you never under another story. I had a, a fucking monk who was uh, an undyne. So I had a swim speed and they were a monk. So I was like, oh, they're so fast. They're never going to. I don't need skills in swim. Because I have a swim speed and I'm a monk. I'm just that fast. I'm good. Until we went up against a white first session in a swamp, summoned a a crocodile with an equal speed to me, but they had skills in swim. So anytime there was a contest between us, I lost and they like grappled me, which is against my combat maneuver defense and not my AC, which was what I kitted up. So I was I got killed first session. My monk just got eaten by a crocodile. (laughs) Yeah, just a regular saltwater crocodile, folks. Not a not a fucking monster, just an animal. I will. We'll say it is interesting between combat maneuver defense and uh the those different kinds of uh defenses it yeah. like there's all this like little granularity and some of it is like ah oh, this is a pain in the butt and then sometimes there are these little moments of like ah oh, that's cool like ah oh, it's cool that like i liked touch ac and flat-footed ac i thought that was all very smart the way they did that like one is without your armor bonus and one is without your dex bonus essentially yeah yeah right? yeah yeah, and that, like that makes sense because some things should target a different kind of AC. Uh, in in second edition, they just made those conditions. So now flat footed yeah. is a condition you apply to somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the yeah, there's a lot of like that little granularity. There's like some really cool stories that come from like ah, oh, that's that's like kind of unique. Um, mm-hmm. that you kind of miss a little bit when you play like some of these other systems. Um. But yeah, and and then so that was we had started on Pathfinder first edition. And then after the first session, I just had to call it. I was like, look, 
we're just going to do second edition. We're just going to switch <laughs> from first edition to second edition. And, and second edition was a big compromise between like, okay, you guys want uh, to play a game that's like a little bit more technical and I'm okay. I want to run a game that's a little bit technical uh, too. And um, I am kind of not really feeling fifth edition. So this is what we're going to be playing. And uh, we've been having a lot of fun with second edition. Um, yeah. To be perfectly fair, like a big part of the heavy lifting is in fact done by the apps. Like the um the, the they have a character builder online yeah, that is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I actually don't know if we'd be playing if they didn't have those apps available because like I think they like the idea of playing a technical game, but I don't know if they want to do the legwork of um, having to look up every single ability and every single thing to make sure it's correct. Like, or if I had to do that, like sit there and be like, all right, I'm going to go by through your character sheet line by line to make sure everything's like there. But it's, it's uh, yeah, it's it's it makes it very convenient because they upload all of the stuff, all the stuff that they release that you can buy. Um, most of it is available online. So when you buy that stuff, you're just supporting Paizo so that you can have like a physical copy. Uh, they're not hiding that stuff behind a paywall. Yeah. Looking at you, d d Beyond. Uh, yeah, the fact that everything's uh, free and online yeah. is actually great, yeah. Um, I will say, though, you have to be... One thing I did not like about Pathfinder, I still don't like it, preparing oh, spells to slots. I don't mm. like that, and I never right, have, yeah. and I never will. Yeah, that's I. I hate it. I wish they would never. They didn't bring that back. I. I loved Fifth Edition allowing you to. You must prepare your list of spells, but you can cast however many of them you want using the slots available to you once you've prepared that mm. list. I and have that, not. To me, yeah. it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally understand. The only case that I've heard for it in terms of like, ah, this might be kind of cool is the fact that it, it means that your loadout feels very personalized uh, in a way that's like unique to like, ah, oh, I'm going to go into this thing for this day and then I have this stuff. And then if I don't have it, can't cast it. But um, the problem is, is that there's a lot of these like really noodly third party, like kind of obscure spells that never get cast because it's like you have to like, you have to slot in, let's say, produce rope. Like, in ye olden days, it wouldn't get cast because it's like, okay, you're going to tell me every single day I'm going to save one slot for produced rope for the one day that I'm going to need the rope. And not only that, but sometimes you'd be like, ah, it's never going to come up and you get rid of it. And then it's like two days down. It's like, oh, where's produce rope? It's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. It's, it's... I play a, a game every Sunday of Pathfinder 2nd Edition, and I play a cleric, so prepared spells and all that. And my DM is very good about forecasting to me what we might be doing the next okay. day. Like, gives me an idea, a little bit of foreknowledge, like you're you're going to be heading in this area to do this thing. These are some of the things you know about this area, uh, be it like terrain, monsters, people. And that helps me a lot. Like... I'm allowed like and, and I can get away with doing some really creative stuff because I have a little foreknowledge and I can sort of prepare. I just played like a one shot with some friends this past weekend, like in person. Very, it's been a while since I did an in-person game. And uh, my friend, you know, bless his heart, bless his heart, did not forecast really much of anything, said it was a pirate adventure. A lot of us made like seafaring folk uh, for this and we weren't on the water. We weren't on an island. He's like, why did you think you'd be on the water? I'm like, you said it was a pirate adventure, <laughs> dude. You said we'd be on a sh like, like if we're pirates, I imagine we're on a ship. We're fighting other pirates. Like, uh, I didn't know it was like a treasure hunt. Uh, you know, that would mm -hmm. have been more accurate. And not to place all the blame on him or anything. Again, bless his heart, love him. But uh, but I, I was playing like another cleric, and so not having that forewarning, I had a lot of useless spells I couldn't use that game, which kind of sucked a little of the fun away it does i i will say that is one of the challenges when you're doing a one shot of like if if you select spells in a normal game it's like well it'll come up some game but the problem is when you do a one shot like if you pick a, a bad spell it's it's just a rock that's going to drag you the entire session you know yeah, yeah. it's but I, I would say for all of its faults, Pathfinder 2E uh, allows, especially in combat, the combat system is super sleek. They they yeah. actually did do a great job with that, and they make it really easy, especially with the character builder. You can play right out of it. You can add conditions to your character. It auto-calculates what the condition does, and then you can just click on it, and it tells you 
what it does. So it's like okay, yeah. there is a lot there, but with something like this, this tool makes it way more accessible than like like you were saying, first edition, which was like, yeah. oh, we got to look up everything. What page is that on? Oh, we got to flip to this and do <laughs> do this and that and the other. Uh, yeah, so much, I can understand so if you pl- if you'd played it for a year, things started to get second nature. But man, like when you're going from someone who first is like, uh, we're just like, look, we're we don't like my my players don't have time to spend like a week, like making their character like every evening kind of going through like, oh, what do I want? They're going to show up to the session. Their character won't be leveled up. They will spend five minutes trying to level them up. You know, yeah. and that and for that group, I need something like a little bit that's that's kind of punchier. Um, but uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's the so here was another major change is that I um, so I I wanted to try and run a sandbox um, hex crawl game where you have a bunch of hexes and the players are able to explore it and kind of go where they ever they want kind of a thing. It's It's kind of a big open ended sort of exploratory thing. And I tried to run it. For like five years, I've tried to have this game in my head that I wanted to run. And each time it was like not quite the way that I wanted it. And the this this one is closer. This one's probably closest I've gotten. I, I think this is exactly the iteration of how I wanted it. Um, it's We still got to wait and finish the campaign and see how it, it turns out in the end. But um, there's a few major differences uh, with this particular hex crawl and stuff that I wanted to avoid. First is that with this hex crawl i wanted to avoid it being too boring because some hex crawls are like you go to certain locations and like nothing happens or you got to track like water and like rations and i knew i didn't want that um and the previous time i had done hex crawls uh the i had given them a main story quest i had given them some big thing that they need like okay you're going to be going into this forest and there's going to be four shrines that you're going to go to and you're going to grab a macguffin from each of them and then you're going to come back and that'll save the universe and Mm -hmm. (laughs) they go in there and the problem is is that i wanted to give them a bunch of these other supplemental missions that are going on like these little side quests but the problem is is that the thing that i realized i finally put it together is the fact that if the players have a main msq a main story quest that they're going after when you're giving them the side quests a lot of times they kind of view it as like well you know we kind of have some other thing we're going to do but we'll come back and do this later but it's like when you completed the main story like it saved the world like no one's going to come back and like shear the sheep with like little timmy if like they're trying to save the world you know and stuff like that so it it was like always like i wanted it to be free for a little bit more free form but it never really came out that way because it felt like, oh, there's always like bigger stuff that's go- like going on that's that's more pressing. So the the rule that I had for this one is first off, um, I do not give you any que- like there's no main story quest flat out. It's just not there. You, you go to this location uh, and the, the rule is the way that it works is whenever you go to a new location and you're like talking to NPCs and stuff, I will give you all of the missions from that area. So, like, let's say you go to a town, and this particular town is, like, Solitude in Skyrim. It's like, ah, we Mm -hmm. need, like, uh, we need you to go find a bull or something like that. Oh, we need you to go do a thing. And, like, okay, here's (laughs) here's the mission. And it's as simple as can possibly be. And then you go to another town, and they have their own set of problems, and they give you other missions and stuff like that. So the, the other thing is the missions are not interdependent on each other, meaning you gathering a medallion for one town is not dependent on this other town getting you know the largest pumpkin for a fair or something like that like try to have them because the the thing is is that i felt i was stressing myself out to have everything feed into the one main storyline or one main msq and i was like i i I don't want to do that anymore i just want to have these separate missions that are not related to each other. So that way, if the players decide to drop one of the missions or like something happens, something comes up, this other one can still just happen. Right. Yeah. So that's what I've been experimenting with. I've been really happy with it so far. It's it's definitely cut down a lot on how much time I spend GM, like prepping for the session because I don't have to connect it to everything else that's going on. I just have to be like, this is the problem that they're having. And then like, go. <laughs> yeah quick quick and dirty uh, yeah. just get it going like let's let's play let's not waste time yeah so i've i've been decently happy with it we're starting to build up a storyline um Courtney died last session so it's everything is going on oh. right now 
<laughs> par for the course. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, actually, I loved I loved your last video at the time of oh, recording thanks. this with uh, Asiago. It's like I could feel her energy radiate radiating out of that character. Oh, uh, that yeah, that yeah. is her character, right? I am right to assume yes. that. Oh my god! Yes, yeah, hundred okay. percent. That is her character. <laughs> like, I'm like, uh, this has such Courtney energy. I'm like, I can tell. I can tell who this is. Um, the, oh, but maybe I could eat them, and then constantly having to be stopped from eating them, like. Yeah, yeah, no, I I played at that table. I know what that's like. <laughs> yeah, because she uh, also was um was it Cal or um the Mon Calamari? It was LP. From yeah, LP, one. right, yeah. right. Oh God, that was but, that was a yeah. that was a good game. But, we kind of come full circle here. Um, I this has been a really fun conversation. I think we're uh -huh. reaching a little past an hour and ten on our recording here. So. I wondered if you would like to close out our uh, podcast with a story uh, that you might want to tell. One that maybe you aren't going to animate or something or you don't care about yeah, sure. it coming out later as an animation. Oh, okay. Got it. Uh, so uh, this this one's going to be a little bit of a shorter story. Um, okay. And it's basically that um, the... So the thing is, when I first... One of the interesting things is that when you've played for a while, you start to kind of understand like how um how the mechanics of of dungeons and dragons like work and uh like oh we need this particular thing like this ability solves this thing what's like right. what's the difference between a disease and a curse and what's the difference between x and y and stuff like that and it's interesting because when i had first made the character of Allegaris and I was, I was playing through that storyline he didn't know what anything was you get to have that like oblivious first player experience and it's it, like people talk a lot of times about like metagaming where like a ah, dragon's flying overhead and even if you've net like if you played for the edition you can probably rattle off the um was it the entire dragon's like stats and um and figure out like oh, okay it's it's this thing and it does this you know and, and these are its stats um this is a story from we had like gone into um a uh what is it uh we were playing and there was a particular town that was like had this disease that like uh everyone was like sick and dying and stuff like that and um there were these like cures that were being sold but the cures would like make them like okay for a little bit and um i remember we went and we talked to the sultan the sultan himself was like and this was kind of this uh sort of Ar arabian themed area and he was very sick and and dying uh from mm -hmm. this disease and he had all of his like servants and and medical professionals like looking at him and the um we had our like cleric come up to him and says like hey can i like try and treat you and see if i can i can like fix it. it's like oh i've had you know the best medical doctors in the realm like look at me and no one can figure out what's happened and he's like okay i'll i'll, I'll try and like treat you and he rolls in the medical and it does nothing because of course it does mm. nothing. And then um, the, and every, all of us are kind of like new players and um, the, the dwarf cleric is like, okay, what if I, I'll just cast like remove curse on him. And the GM looks at him and goes like, what? And he's like, oh yeah, I just leveled up. I, I just got this new spell. It's called like remove curse. And the oh, GM's no. like, can I, can I read the description of, of like what it does? And he like looks through it and he reads it. And he goes, okay, you can do that. That's fine. And then he casts it and it's, ah, he, he removes the disease, air quotes, disease. It was actually a curse. And uh -huh. everyone is like happy, he's thrilled. And it's like, ah, oh, it was this curse. And, and we, we've, we uncovered the plot for like what's going on in the city. I remember me as Alagaris as a player going, oh, like being just absolutely gobsmacked. <laughs> <laughs> that like oh my god you're like he like in this moment this player is such a genius like he figured it out he got you know and, and fixed it and stuff but like right. anyway and um we investigated we got to the bottom of it we figured out what was going on it turns out it was a demon that had like its demonic blood went into the blood water supply or something like that and it was like cursing Ooh. people um but and then and then that demon was then subsequently selling them the cure for it <laughs> that would <laughs> make them feel better for a little bit, but wouldn't actually fix them. But the the big part, I think, about the story, what's memorable to me is that if I was in that moment now, that wouldn't be my reaction. 
my reaction in that moment if I was playing as Alagaros would be like, you didn't think it was a curse? Like, wouldn't you have like, oh, he has the highest level mages. Wouldn't they have come by and like done a, like tried to, you know, remove curse or even the idea that like in D&D, &D, <laughs> there's like two main things. It's either a curse or a disease. <laughs> you right, know, yeah. or something like that. But it's it's like funny because it's that like, that magic in a way is kind of broken in terms of like, you know, the mechanics of the game now. And now you can look at it. It's like, oh, it's but it, like at the time it seemed really clever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you kind of have to pretend when you're in, in that character's shoes and you like this is why I don't like high magic settings, because things like disease and curses become trivial. It's like, well, everything can be fixed with uh, by like literally just a traveling dude. If he's fifth level, he's got it. He's got your answer for it. You know, like yeah. um, in a low magic setting. Uh, generally like what I, I tend to do to kind of balance things out uh, i make it so that most like people do not breach like fifth level and it's very rare that you find any one of the magic classes especially breaching that level so like magic classes are more rare than marshals and uh generally like do not reach those levels very as often uh, yeah. it's like harder somehow yeah. for people in general yeah. and obviously that's no limitation to the party they're the heroes of course they get access to that because they're the main characters but like the people that you find like you're you know in a game where you're playing with me as dm you might find uh for every five martial npcs that have levels in monk or fighter or even ranger with the it's limited sort of pool of magic um you might get one actual cleric or one actual like wizard you yeah know? and it's the the reason it was like inter the story's interesting to me also is in term or like i think about it on occasion is just because like sometimes what will happen is you'll have a player who plays like a high level like 20th level wizard you know, and then they play, make a new character and they're playing like a fighter. And it's like, okay, how is this fighter going to deal with these problems, not having access to these same spells and abilities? And sometimes what players do is they still want to have access to all the wizard stuff that they can do, but they still want to keep their fighter. And so their compromise is they're like, oh, like I still want to scry, so I'll just hire a wizard to scry, you know, or I'll hire this person to like do this certain ability and stuff. And sometimes it feels a little bit of a cop out of like, uh, like wouldn't a wizard like want to help us, you know, for free? Like and <laughs> would just give us or like sometimes what save the is, world here. Are you telling me there's yeah. no one who wants to volunteer the services? Yeah. Really? And then like, or sometimes it, someone gets cursed and it's like, okay, how are they going to solve this problem? They can't remove curse. And it's like, well, we'll find a player, a character who can remove curse, who's really nice and wants to do it for free and then get them to remove the curse for us. Um, and so sometimes it's like, sometimes they rely a little bit too much on the NPCs. And I do wonder about that. Um, like how much are they reliant on them? Right. Uh, yeah. And it's, but anyway, it, it just has the, the question of like, when you have, access to the book and they have access to certain abilities like they they sometimes use they develop certain channels for like how they go about solving the problems and it's hard to kind of get the players out of that a little bit yeah yeah it, it can be easy to kind of i don't know it, literally it's kind of a magic wand having magic it, like it really is just ah you're no longer so like one of the things i did for my curse of strahd game to make it more interesting i made a variety of existing spells and a lot of the new ones I had like sort of introduced like I have like a list of new spells people can also pick from um, that are now they now have the curse tag so just like some have a ritual tag when you use ritual casting on them mm -hmm. these have a curse tag that means dispel magic doesn't work on these you need remove curse and remove curse works like dispel magic in that you can upcast it to uh, dispel higher level curse spells it's like almost exactly the same right mm -hmm. um so that means let's say someone casts polymorph that's a curse spell like someone gets turned into a frog you want to dispel magic on that frog that was your friend nope they're cursed mm -hmm. you need to remove curse I, spell to get rid of that yeah i do i do like the fact that the um going back into pathfinder it's like harder to get rid of certain magical effects where like if you want to counter spell something you got to like blow a turn beforehand to like try and counter it whereas in in like D &D, yeah. i think i think counterspell might be a bit overpowered in fifth edition it's very it's very it's it's almost a necessity if you are an arcane caster to have that yeah. as a as a uh defense but 
I love the Magic the Gathering like counterspell. I counterspell oh, yeah. the counterspell. Like you can, there's nothing in the rules to say you can't do that. I had a, a game where someone's like, you can't counterspell a counterspell. I'm like, really? I was like, the DM made that call. And I'm like, but that's really fun, DM. Why won't you let us do that? Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the the only one that does like irk me. I don't know if this is actually in the rules or not is, is someone goes to cast a spell. The they counterspell it and then the person who is currently casting then does a counterspell because that's like and I, I i understand the interpretation for both why because one's an action the other's reaction for me it's the fact that you're spending your action to cast and then like you have one hand casting and the other hand doing your reaction or something like that like yeah but i get it i get I, it i yeah that's that's i get that that might be i might make a uh I might make a, a a home rule about that. Like if you are actively casting the spell using an action, um, then uh, you can't counter spell. If your spell is getting countered, you can't counter that spell with your reaction. Yeah, uh, but, but I would I, I would allow it for like uh, bonus action spells. I would like allow it. I'm like, that's I mean, it, it insinuates that it's quicker to do it yeah. as a bonus. But action. it's the funniest thing when player one casts. And then the opponent goes to counterspell, and then player two counterspells the counterspell, letting the yeah. first one resolve. That I think is cool. That I love. Yeah. Well, that's. I mean, you can be a counterbot. That's like being a healer. It's like you're protecting the magic of your party. You're making your party more useful by just waiting in the wings and counterspelling uh, the the enemy mages before they can stop you from popping off your shit. Um, yeah I, I i like i like it because why i like counterspell is that anybody can try a counterspelling uh that has access to it and that means that yeah my enemies like my my bad guys that i'm running who have access to it can do it and that sucks when they counterspell a healing spell because they're bastards and they might do it um but if the players all have sort of the ability to spec into stuff that might give them access to that then they can do it too. It's not like I'm not going to make it so that my characters just yeah. can't be counterspelled. I might be smart and upcast something just so that I'm banking on you only spending a third level slot. So I spend a fourth level to make sure you have to make a check yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. But like, I mean, that's about the extent of it. If if you make the check, you counter the spell. Yeah. Like, I'm not going to yeah. say, no, that doesn't work. That sucks. You know? Yeah. But but I will say that it does change the playstyle because normally what people imagine is like, ah, oh, like one zombie, necro one big necromancer, so like, ah, oh, I'm this powerful wizard. And then like they have a bunch of like zombies that come up. Like you got one asshole who's casting it. The problem is that usually that doesn't work because if you have three counterspellers, like the lich isn't going to do anything or like the, the mm -hmm. spellcaster. So normally the way that those encounters work is you've got the one lich a bunch of zombies and then two other dudes next to him who are also wizards who are able to kind of do their magic to sort of protect him or if he gets like stun locked or something they can like do a dispel to like get rid of it yeah i uh it's yeah no i mean that that's always a risk with i mean if like if you've made if you're playing a party that invested three characters into counter spelling then clearly as a dm you have a lot of magic enemies that they needed this for <laughs> like yeah, yeah. they're just they're just responding to the world they're in generally that's generally the case unless mm -hmm. they're like oh. super metagamey and they just have played enough games where they're like we all want to have this because oh. we know how good it is this, this is a complete side note i have one other thing to talk about uh, yeah go for it a little bit of time. it's um i actually someone did this discussion about like flying characters and stuff like that and um they had a discussion which i agreed with which is the idea of ranged advantage which is the idea that the party usually is at an advantage against most enemies from range and the reason being that most enemies want to be in melee like most of the monsters want to be in melee and so usually if you're ever in a situation where it's ranged the players are at an advantage hmm yeah yeah, they are, aren't they? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's like the fighter can is like it's not great with a bow, but they can still use it. You know, uh, there are a few characters that are, in fact, melee characters like you've got like the monks and stuff like that. Um, dragons are exception where they tend to be ranged. They want to like breath weapon and then fly away. Um, yeah. But it's like then you have like Aboleth. And if the Aboleth can't touch you, you know, you're kind of out of 
out of you know it's it's like difficult like chimeras want range but usually the players are at an advantage when they're you know far away right yeah that's i mean part of the uh this is just a minor th it's not really even a spoiler uh those who have heard of curse of strahd i talk about every episode haha -ha. um strahd has been misplayed in certain games um, no single character is so powerful that if you with your, you know, when you've leveled up your characters to the max that they are allowed to in the module and they all the marshals surround this one character and just start beating down on them. I'm sorry. Strahd can get brought down by that. Like he's strong, but he's not God as much as he w would like to be God. Right. Surrounding him in such a way can be a very easy way to misplay Strahd. Strahd would not allow that to happen to him, right? So, like, if you're playing, like, a bad guy uh, who's just, like, who can do sort of... Uh, even if they are, like, they have melee capabilities, if they've got range, they're going to do the range first. The bad guys are just as smart as the... Uh, I mean, the big bats are supposed to be just as smart as the players, if not smarter. They would use, they would know getting surrounded is bad. They would try their best to not let that happen to them and use their own ranged uh, yeah. tactics as well um, before it gets to that. That doesn't mean that they would never do melee, but more like you said, like hit and run where the dragon, again, dragons get misplayed, where they drop down in front of everybody to allow the marshals to start wailing on them. Like, nah, dragon's going to sweep by breath weapon and then go high up in the air where you can't yeah. get them. And then they're going to recharge their breath, come back for another volley, you know? Yeah, because like, I that's think the people, smart move. <laughs> I think people, and I, I get it, because like from their perspective, like you read the stat plot block of Strahd and you see like a bite attack. Like, oh my God, like he can like turn people into vampire. I'm going to have him like run up to you know the fighter and like bite him or the paladin and, and like bite him in the neck or something but it's like that's so hard you know like it's actually better for Str like strahd to just down one person like unconscious body and then bite you know and then be like oh, yeah you're a vampire or now. i mean like, and he's also he's very charming he has a charm he's a vampire he would use that probably before letting it come to you know a fight uh, it's something I guess a tip for anybody playing Strahd out there as like a Curse of Strahd DM like remember he's like he was a man once and as a man he was like like he was in the military he was like a warrior yeah. you know he was not just some dude he knows tactics he knows how to survive in battle so you got to be sure that you're playing him smartly and making use of all of his abilities and um, you know his he has like minions and shit like make sure you're using those too yeah uh, it's also just like in fifth edition, it's really hard for one character to fight six players. Like it doesn't matter how, like how many levels, like if he's 15 levels on him, maybe, but like <laughs> it's, it's like just ignoring his other abilities, just a man fight. He doesn't like the players are going to have six actions. They're going to be able to stun him among flurry of blows. He spends legendary resistance. Like it's, it's not going to go great for him. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I don't want to say any more on on that particular character because I know people who would love to know more, but uh, I'll, I'll try to keep that to my chest. All, all I mean is that like it, it can be really easy. My first D and D five E game. Sorry, we were gonna end this a while ago, but we're just we're just we're just going. Um, okay, well, fine. Awesome. My my uh, oh, no, yeah. Sorry, we, we'll we'll end soon. We'll end soon. But like I uh, I just remember I played a warlock uh, named Red. I did like the fiendish pact or whatever, and um. We went up against the big bad, who was a wizard, who was uh, it was like Horde of the Dragon Queen type of uh, it, it spun off, spin off. It was like started as that game, and then they took elements and like homebrewed the rest. Well, we entered the chamber one initiative, and uh, Hypnotic patterned the wizard who failed their save and brought them down, and like killed them like really fast and it was very oh, yeah. anticlimactic and our dm was very upset because they didn't understand that they could give them legendary resistance and and all sorts of stuff but even then even if they had made their save they were so low on initiative we would have probably done enough to get them out of the fight in that first round that it wouldn't have mattered and um it goes to show like that's a rookie mistake there right like if you're running especially a squishy bad guy who's like the mastermind, they're not going to put themselves in harm's way 
you know, if if they can help it, if they can plan yeah. ahead, they're going to plan ahead. They're going to do an ambush. They're going to have themselves protected in some way and have some like big bruiser fighting for them or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, once again, hard to do 1v5 and it's uh, legendary resistance. It's like, for some reason, I, I, I almost never give it to any of my like characters like the high level bosses and stuff if it if a cr monster comes with legendary resistance i'll have it there it, i almost never are like oh this is a fifth level boss i'll give him like one legendary resistance like i don't ever do that i'm just not the biggest fan of that as a mechanic i understand but like yeah that makes sense yeah but it's like i it's like if it comes with it i i enjoy using it it's just that i think the big thing is that it's expected in higher level play because the opponent the players have more um disable effects and then it's more yeah. of like okay this this has like three legendary resistances and the players go in knowing that and like how are we going to get them to use the legendary resistance on xyz like various plans and i think that that's really cool it's just if there's just one it kind of feels like yes they failed their save no okay and it's like they had the one <laughs> you know yeah uh, it, it requires a little ingenuity for sure you might have to homebrew some stuff in game like some story thing some story reason why they can resist something uh that normally they might not be able to resist like yeah. oh they're, they got a macguffin they're wearing that's giving them some extra shit uh you just gotta also be careful if they kill the guy if the players get the macguffin make it don't make it too powerful right mm -hmm. like yeah. give it something that you can also manage as a dm going forward but mm -hmm. um oh yeah, unless it's the final boss. But anyway, okay. I think I think we are reaching the end. So, uh, I mean, I guess, Ben, why don't you tell oh. everybody where people can find you if they don't know already? Oh, I have one last thing. I, oh, one last thing. Go for okay. it. Okay, I've been writing a video game. Uh, so I've been making a video game. Um, yes. So it's going to be, hopefully it'll come out in the next week or two. It's So it's up on the store page already. So this, let me let me just clarify. This particular video game, I, I decided to go into video game, like, production just because i'm interested in it so i have a self-published thing and i'm publishing it on steam and i just want to see it like i'm just it's free and i'm just putting it up just to see what are the issues i'm going to run into uh are there any mechanical problems like what's the thing so that i like potentially a year or two i can actually make like a full release of an actual game so it's yeah, a play test yeah so uh it's right now it's called ball drop and the idea is it's just a puzzle platformer thing where the ball kind of descends and then you use these gears and cogs to guide the ball towards a particular goal. And um, afterwards, I found out I should have called it dropping the ball, but hindsight <laughs> 2020. <laughs> but I'm also I just, like, <laughs> I also just want to release it, just see how it goes out there, see if there's any production issues and stuff like that. Um, Steven's been very surprising to work with because I was so used to YouTube where they just don't care. You can put up whatever you want, like zero Fs given. But Steam, like you publish, like you put stuff up there and then it's like they're very heavy handed. So they, they're they like, we will read through what you're putting up. And then if we like it, it will get a pass. And like the first like store submission i sent to them got rejected and they're like mm, you know like the logo like we kind of want it transparent because it doesn't show up that well against like the background i'm like it like i understand i get it because they're like an mm -hmm. actual legit company and like youtube but um they the thing is is that it's it's such a different environment from youtubing where they're extremely heavy-handed and they will review the product they will write and give you notes and tell you like this is what we think is a problem blah 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 interesting so, so yeah so it's been surprised it's been interesting do you have a link uh i could put in the description for our yeah, viewers yeah. to check I, out i will send you the link awesome sweet uh yeah everybody look in the description below for a link to check out ball drop is it like an early release thing you have going on or people so can the just thing kinda... is is that the way that youtube works is that or sorry not youtube it is uh the way that uh, steam works is that you have to release the game the um the store page first and the store page has to be out for two weeks first with either a date or coming soon and then after the two weeks, after his past review, and then the build has passed review, then it can get released. So uh, can I let them know what date we're recording? I don't know what date this is going to be coming out. It'll probably, whenever this gets released, it'll already be out because the earliest probably. I can release it is like March 12th of 2013. 
Oh yeah, uh, uh, yeah. A twenty. You mean twenty twenty three? Yeah, twenty. Oh, I called it 2013. 2023. <laughs> yeah, yeah. March 12th, <laughs> 10 years ago. What? Yeah. All right. Everybody check it out. It'll definitely be out by the time this is out. Uh, okay. That is so cool. I meant to ask you about that, but we just went right into talking about RPGs and uh, I was having a great time doing that. Um, I, I added that to my wish list. You okay. should do the same to yours. Uh, ben. Thank you for coming on. All right, thank channel. you. Thank you for having me. It was great to catch up. Yeah, everybody check out Ben on YouTube. See you later, Ben. Bye. All right, bye. Bye. Thank you.